Today we're gonna walk you from rags to riches, ending with possibly the most useful cloak I've ever seen in my life. Stay tuned. Greetings adventurers and welcome to Skill Tree where we learn how to do just about everything. So for today's episode, we're digging into our cloth heirs archetype. The knave of the needle, the sultan of the sewing machine. Other alliterative sewing puns. This is gonna be kind of a fun one because it's actually two projects in one. Basically the whole layout of these archetypes is we wanted to start with some of the most basic information and then work our way up. But while I was making the more basic side of this project, I realized that the exact same kind of methods and layouts could be used to make something, something a little more epic. You'll see what I mean as you roll along. For now though, let's jump right in and level up this skill. Okay, so the things that we're gonna be learning today are some basic layout stuff. And also the thing that's daunted me for a while is actually like making buttonholes and sewing on buttons. I figured the best place to start is with kind of like a rough like orc costume. But this does two things for me. It one takes the pressure off of making it look perfect. So I just kind of practice these stitches. And also I found by exaggerating some of these things, I can kind of understand them a little bit better and then narrow them in and get, get a little bit more precise as I go on. For starters, the material I'm using is this basic tarp material that you can pick up at a hardware store. It is cheap, it's rugged, and since it's from a cutoff piece that I use for other projects, it already has this kind of frayed end to it, which is what inspired me to make this more kind of orcish because the, the fabric was already kind of gnarly. In fact, to make it more uniform, I went ahead and cut away all of the finished edges just to make sure everything matched and then frayed it with my fingers a little bit. So this had kind of a few iterations. I started by just kind of wanting to make like a poncho and then I decided to turn into a Rowana cloak so that we can practice those buttons. For starters though, I needed, I needed a hole for my noggin to fit through. To figure out those measurements, I just went ahead and measured around my neck. Though I don't want that like tight neck measurement because I'll never be able to get the thing off, right? Or on, I guess, in the first place. I don't know how it would get there if it's that small. Thinking hard now. So I just kind of opened up that tape until it was a size that I knew it could slide around my head. Now, since I know the circumference, you could math it out, but I just entered it into this app here to get what the radius would need to be. And just in case you don't remember, the radius is from the center of the circle to one of the walls, which in this case was about four inches for me. Now the tool I'm deciding to use for this is actually this compass here, which I measured out to be those four inches. But if you don't have a compass, you can just use anything that's round like this plate here. First, we go ahead and fold this thing in half and then in half again in the other direction. This leaves us with this one corner here that has no like outside edges to it, right? It's that corner that everything just kind of folded around, which is actually the very center of the piece. Now, if you're using something round, all you have to do is measure from the corner what your radius was, and then just line your plate or whatever up with that line. Conversely, if you have a compass, you just stick it onto the corner and then make your arc. Just so it's a little more clear, let me show you with a little piece of paper here. You're basically taking this thing along its longest side here and folding it in half. Then you fold it in half again. This corner here, which represents basically the center of that piece, is what gets cut. This way, when you open it back up, your hole is right in the middle of the piece. So by cutting my arc out of the fabric, I end up with this perfect hole, which fits around me lovely. Although slightly bigger than I wanted, which is perfectly fine. Like this is supposed to be orcish clothing. Again, this is why we're doing the simpler project first because I don't mind these little mess ups. It's meant to look rough and a little bit unfitted. And if you dig the poncho look, you could totally stop right there, just kind of shore up the edges or whatever. But we're gonna be kind of making a Rowana cloak with this. If you don't know what that is, check out this video here where I made a waterproof version. But it's dead simple. All I had to do is fold this thing in half lengthwise and then cut directly up the front of it to the neck hole. This opening in the front now leaves me with these two pieces that kind of hang down, which is what makes this cloak so much fun because with those two pieces, you can do a whole bunch of different stuff with it. You can cross it in front of you. You can bring it up behind your shoulders. You can make a hood out of the thing. It is one of the more versatile cloaks. But again, the reason I'm doing this project is because I want to go over some of these basics here and how we kind of pull off sewing these by hand and putting buttons and buttonholes in place. Although I'm fine with all the other edges being rough, these edges right here, one, they have to be thick enough to be able to support a button and a buttonhole. And two, I, this is where I'm gonna be like operating a lot. I don't want this all kind of falling apart on me. So I go ahead and fold over the fabric along that edge. Now this rough wooden button here is what I'm gonna be using. So I make sure there's enough space in this fold for a button and its hole to fit in. 
Then I fold this over one more time, not only to make the fabric more thick, but also to hide that unfinished edge further. Happy with that, I just make sure I iron it into place to lock in that crease. All right, so the one stitch we're going to be learning today is the most basic stitch in sewing, which is called the running stitch. Now prefacing all of this, the point of the show is I have no idea what I'm doing and you learn along with me. So if I say something wrong and you know what you're talking about, do leave it down in the comment section below to teach all of us. But with a running stitch, basically what it is, is if you picture like, like cartoon sewing, right? Like nothing complicated, it's just in one side, back out the other side. In one side, back out the other side. Also, and this is a question I have, what's the difference between a basting stitch and a running stitch? Is it just the, the length? Because if so, I think I think I end up doing a basting stitch. I think otherwise it's exactly the same, right? But this is what I'm talking about. I'm gonna be making this kind of bigger, so A, you can see it, and B, I can kind of learn the technique without stressing about things being too small. Anyways, for starters, let's get that thread on the needle. Of course, I just passed the thread through the eye and I doubled it up. I did learn kind of a nifty trick though to tie the knot at the end of it. You just grab the end and you wrap it around your finger there. And then you take that loop that you've made and you rub it between your fingers so that it rolls. And then you simply pull that loop away and bam, you're left with a little knot. That's way easier than trying to like, like thread it around itself and whatever, I love that. Another thing I learned is to pay attention to the actual like grain of the fabric. As you can see here, there's kind of a pretty big pattern that I was able to line up nice and easily, but that's a super easy way to make sure everything's lined up and you're not gonna get like weird wrinkles or it's gonna be kind of off kilter a little bit. Not only that, but when I'm actually doing my running stitch, I'm still using that kind of grain line or, or the threads in general to like, guide my way. Like I don't have to draw a line like I used to. I can just kind of follow that that thread count. Though I'm sure that's easier with something like this big and chunky than it is with like a, a much tighter weave fabric. Still, I thought that was neat. All right, again, so the basics of this thing is we're just gonna kind of go through all of the fabric, rock the needle back so that it can then come back out again and pull it on through. That's another technique I really like because before I'd like put it through, bring it all the way out this side, put it back in, bring it all the way out this side. But actually you just kinda, you put it in and you rock it back and forth and then you just pull it through at once and bam, you got a little stitch. The hardest part is making sure that the stitch lengths are all the same. I actually did find though that taking more than one bite at a time made this easier actually because I could compare all these little humps here and if they're all kind of the same size, I knew I had roughly the same amount of material. This way when you pull it through, not only are you doing multiple stitches at once, but I was pretty sure they were pretty much spaced evenly. Doing that, it was super fast to actually sew this thing up by hand, way faster than I thought it would be. Though again, if you're doing like smaller, tighter stitches, obviously it's gonna take a little bit longer because you got more stitches to make, but it's also gonna be a lot stronger because you've got you know more connection points. At the end to lock this thing into place, I just back stitched one length, making sure to only pass through the topmost layer of fabric. After I pulled the needle out, there's this little loop left over here, which I pass the needle through twice and then cinch it down to lock in that knot. Then to hide the tail, I pass it again through only one layer of fabric, pulling the tail through and cutting it close so that it disappears. And check that out, that's not bad. Most of the stitches are pretty uniformly length. Again, you gotta correct me if I'm wrong, I think because of the spacing, it might be more akin to a basting stitch. But still, for what I'm going for, something kind of more orcish and rough, and giving me the freedom to practice the motion a lot more before I try to narrow it down and make it perfect. That looks pretty good, I'm pretty excited about that. All right, now we're gonna add some buttons to it. And this for a long time, this made me nervous. Like buttonholes especially, like black magic to me. Honestly, sewing is black magic to me. This, this project, man kicked my ass a little bit, I'm not gonna lie to you. Not the org one, the one after, you'll see. Anyways, to put the buttonholes into place, I started by placing my buttons on the side the holes will go to, roughly spaced apart how I wanted them. Then I marked on either side of the button to get the measurement right. Then I made a line connecting those two lines right up the center and cut my hole through all of the fabric. Now, the rough thing about using this kind of rough of a fabric is one, just how giant all of the, the threads are. And because it is such a cheap fabric, there's a very like low thread count. So it just, 
it just frays immediately which isn't a problem again what i'm looking for but it is a problem on camera like you can't see it just eats the thread sometimes so to demonstrate this better i'm actually using a different piece of material here so as you can see i marked the width of the button again and then put a line right across the middle like i did before then to help guide me i actually put two more lines on either side making it roughly the width of my button then again i just cut this line in the center giving me what's going to become my buttonhole. Okay, so we start by passing our needle from the back along that little guideline that we made here on one end. The needle then passes through the buttonhole and back up through that line, keeping us evenly spaced apart. Before pulling it all the way out though, take the thread and wrap it around the needle once and then pull it through. This will lock the stitch into place, but it's also gonna end up rimming the inside of that hole with the thread. To show you better, I actually made it really big here, like made them very far apart. So you can see kind of what the pattern looks like and you see the thread on the inside of that slit there. I thought that was really cool actually. And I can see as you make those like much more tight and much more clean, that's gonna end up being kind of a solid like knotting of fabric in there protecting that hole. Now, because I was playing with widths and all of that, my first one is super grody looking, it's terrible. But the button does fit, so mini success. Still, I decided to try one more time, this time adding these little bump outs on either side, just to give me more room to work with when I got to the edges. In this one, I did a much more clean of a job. Oh, also I learned when you're finished with it to lock it into place, on the underside of the buttonhole, just line up your needle with the fabric here and wrap the thread around it three times. Then just hold that thread into place as you pull the needle through to secure the knot down close to the fabric and cut away the excess. And this is a much better buttonhole. I'm more proud of that one. That one's much better. Now I used way bigger like leather thread on my actual little orc one. I made them super wide apart just because I wanted them again to look super rough. And though they're ugly as hell, I'm pretty sure they're gonna do the job. I'm all right with that. So using them as a guide, I went ahead and marked where my buttons will need to go. And then locking in those buttons are easy. I just went ahead and passed the needle from the back of the fabric right through that mark that I had made. Then passed it through one of the eyes in the button. Next, I passed the needle through the eye on the opposite side and back down through all the fabric. I just went back and forth doing this, making sure I hit all of those eyes before finally sending that needle just behind the button. From here, we're gonna take that thread and we're gonna wrap it around all of the threads that are coming through the fabric underneath the button there. Basically, we're trying to make a little shank there that keeps the button raised up a little bit from the fabric and gives you enough space for the, for the fabric that's gonna like go around it, right? In that buttonhole. Once we're done doing our windings, we simply pass that thread back through the back of it. Then just like we did with the running stitch, we're gonna pass the needle through one layer of the fabric, tie that bad boy into a knot, and cut off anything excess. And check that out, we got working buttons. It sounds silly and I'm sure any of you have like been sewing for a while, like this is not a big deal. To me, it's a big deal. Like it's been very daunting for me for a while to do buttons. Very proud of them. They're ugly, but I'm still proud of them. I don't care. And then my creepy little rough spun orc thing. That's what it is. It's, it's like the, the rough spun things you get at the beginning of Skyrim. You know what I'm saying? You're going to be wearing this and someone's going to be like, so you're finally awake. And again, you can go ahead and finish any of these edges that you want to. You just kind of fold them down like we did before and then sew them into place. But now I'm going to show you the cool thing about like learning the basics that way. Because everything we just did can be used to become something just way more awesome. As an FYI, by the way, this was originally going to be just the project. But while I was making it, I was like, you know, this is easy. And I bet, I bet we can really kind of raise this up if we wanted to. Basically, I decided to take on too much last minute and... And here we are, I've overdone it. So the inspiration for what comes next is actually this cloak here from the Musketeer show. I've never seen the show, but I saw that picture and I was like, yes, please, I need that in my life. But first, this is empty, I'll be, I'll be right back. Let me just remove this, there will be no free advertising. Okay, one quick caveat. I'm not doing anything like too advanced here. Everything you've just learned, you can use to make something similar to what I'm gonna make. That being said, I do use a sewing machine during this. For two reasons. One, it's a fabric choice, and I'll let you know about it in a little bit. It was dumb on my part, but my options were limited. You'll see. And the other is just a timing thing. I only have like a weekend to shoot these videos, and I definitely bit off more than I could chew here. 
Anywho, to get the measurements for this thing, because I wanted to be a lot more precise than just my orc costume, I went ahead and measured from my sternum to the side where I thought like a seam would end up being. This turned out to be 10 inches, but then I end up adding some more. One is gonna be a half of an inch because I'm gonna be doing a quarter inch seam allowance, which is how much fabric you're gonna have like past the line that you sew, right? So if you sew a seam in, <laughs> a seam in, the fabric on the, the not used side is gonna be like the seam allowance, is how much space you wanna give away from that edge. For me, it's a quarter inch, quarter inch times two, half of an inch. So I add a half inch to my measurement. And then because I don't want this thing to be like form fitting and tight, I add some more giving me about 15 inches. This way it'll be billowy and I can wear like armor underneath it and stuff. I'm definitely gonna wear this to alarm. And just so I don't forget, I lay this thing out in a rough picture I drew on my iPad. Cool, with that measurement in place, I figure out the length of this thing, measuring from my shoulder down to about mid shin. This gives me about 52 inches, which again, I plot into my little directions here. Okay, so the fabric I'm using is actually this faux suede. It is beautiful. It drapes so nicely. It has that kind of suede appearance and I'm going for kind of a, a real aristocrat the complete opposite of this, right? I'm going for kind of a nobleman feel to it. Now what I wanted, I really wanted some wool, but they only had like felted wool, which sits kind of stiff. And the only other choice that fell the right way that I wanted to have the same kind of feel was more like a fleece. And it kind of felt like I was wearing a blanket. So I went with this one though. The downside of it, and this is one of the other reasons I'm using the sewing machine, is it is not only a very thick material, but it's kind of a spongy material. Meaning, it is actually really hard to pass a needle through it. Like, if I'm hand sewing, and it would be a lot of sewing, that would be a hard choice. So if you're not using this type of fabric, I mean, even if you are using this type of fabric, you could probably sew it by hand, but I'd recommend, I'd recommend a machine for something like this. Anywho, I started by measuring out that height, which was 52 inches and marking the fabric there. Then I folded it in half because remember, this thing is gonna like sandwich board around me, right? It's gonna drape around me. So that needs to be doubled. With that where I need it, I just went ahead and cut away the excess fabric, giving me the right measurement I need. It actually worked out that the width of the fabric right here is 30 inches. Since from my center to here kind of measurement was that 15 inches, 15 times two is 30. That's pretty much exactly where I need to be. So from here though, we're starting out basically exactly where we started out with this thing. And the only reason I didn't have to measure this thing is because it was like exactly small enough for, for what I needed. So I do exactly the same thing using my measurements to cut this neck hole here only a little bit smaller because we learned from the last one and I knew I could come in just a bit more and this is a much better fit now again just like before we're gonna slice right up the middle of this thing to give us those two open sections like the Rwanda cloak and right there look at how good that looks like this thing would be cool just as is and I love the way this fabric drapes. I do love my fabric choice, as much of a pain as it was for me. I do like it. Speaking of fabric choice, I wanted this thing to be lined. Again, I want it to be super posh, so I thought having a lining with it would be just perfect. So I end up getting this, I think it's called the brocade, but it has this really nice subtle pattern in it. And if you look in the back side, it's even more subtle, with most of the surface being kind of a matte finish and only the pattern being shiny. I love that subtle little pop. Like you won't be able to see it until you're close enough to look at it. And then it's just going to look so refined and dope. I love that. But with this, I did the same exact thing. Same measurements and everything landing me kind of with this Rowana thing right here. Now to connect these two together, I simply put one over the other with the outside faces, which are the faces that I want to actually be showing on the outside facing each other. We're starting with this thing inside out because that's going to help us hide the seams that we make. I simply pin this into place so that the fabric doesn't move on me. And then it's off to the sewing machine, locking all of the edges into place, except for the neck hole and the bottoms of it. The neck hole because I want to attach something here and the bottom of it because that's how we're gonna turn it right side out. Before we do that though, I just cut away a lot of this excess fabric here, which is gonna help it all lay down more flat. Then upon turning this thing inside out, you can see that all of our stitches are hidden. Now, as I said before though, this is stuff you could do by hand, right? Rather than running it through the sewing machine, you could have just used that running stitch to combine these two together. It would have taken longer, obviously, than a sewing machine, but it's 100% doable. To help those seams lay down more flat, I just went ahead and ran an iron along where my sewing lines were. And this gives me this really clean break between the two different sides. And look at how cool that looks. The outside has this really kind of posh suede, the inside, this neat little design. 
I love that. That's really cool. I'm gonna be such a nobleman. Again, though, I left this neck hole open. And that's because, like the ones that were in the show, I really liked the, the vibe of it having a collar. Which I had no idea how to make a collar, but it's actually pretty easy. To help get my measurements, though, I actually put on this peacoat that I had because it has a nice high collar, and I use that as a reference to see how tall I want this thing to be. I want my collar to be a little bit more tall because the character I'm playing is a nefarious underworld kind of boss, and it's, I like the idea that you can pull it up and kind of hide your face if you wanted to. So I take the measurement from the bottom of that collar basically to the tip of my nose, which gives me about seven inches. I also take the measurement of the diameter of the neck opening which landed me at 21 inches. And since I know I'm gonna be like folding all this thing in, I'm gonna give myself an extra inch, giving me 22 inches, which I draw along my paper here. At the end of that line, I go up that seven inches that I measured before to get the height. In the back here, I'm measuring four and a half inches, and then again in the center. That's basically gonna be like the back of your neck here. I don't want that to be really big and chunky. So if it's four and a half inches, when I fold it down, it's gonna end up being like two and a quarter inches high, which is nice right behind my neck. For the last bit, we want these things to have kind of points that stick out above. I don't just want them kind of flat down. So I measure an inch away from my seven inch line there and make a mark. Then I connect that line to my starting line here. Then I connect all the rest of the lines together, starting with this little swoosh and evening back out to my four and a half inches between my other two lines. This isn't how you make a dress shirt collar. There's an extra little piece underneath the dress shirt collar that's called a stay, I guess. But for my purposes here, this is exactly what I'm going for. It's more kind of like my coat. Though I didn't want to cut this out of the fabric until I've tested it. So first I cut out that piece of paper and I just kind of felt where it would be and realized that my point here was just way too big. I think an inch was too much. So I folded that down, then copied it and taped them together so I can try what it would actually feel like as a collar. Happy with that, I cut it out of some fabric and pinned it to my actual piece just to make sure it fit exactly how I needed it to. And this thing was looking good. I was happy with that. The measurement was perfect. It landed exactly where I wanted it to. Fantastic. Here's the thing though, both the, the outside material and the inside material, it's, it's drapey, which is great. And it's kind of thin, which is not good for a collar. You want something that can hold its shape, right? Either it's gonna stick up and stay up or it's gonna come down and keep that fold. In order to make that happen, you have to somehow shore up that material a bit. To do that, we're gonna use something called interfacing. I have a little bit of a black scrap fusible interfacing here, which is great because I have black fabric and I don't want any of the white to shine through with like my white interfacing. Now, as I said, this is fusible interfacing, which means it has a glue on the back side of it. There's other ones that are so in interfacing, they don't have that glue. You actually have to sew it into place. But all it is is a stiffer material that helps add body to your fabric. So starting with my inside fabric, I just use that fabric model that I made as a template and then cut out the shape that I needed. Then I ironed my fusible interfacing into place, melting the glue and locking it to the fabric. Then that piece I used as a template for my faux suede. You'll notice here too, just like before when we were putting the, the inside and the outside together, the sides that you want to show out, I have facing each other and touching. That's because from here, we're actually just gonna sew around the edges to lock it into place. Again though, leaving the bottom of it open because we need to flip it right side out once we're done. You'll notice there's been a sewing machine change. Uh, the only reason I was using my leather sewing machine is because I broke, I broke the other two sewing machines while working on this project. Had nothing to do with the fabric or anything. They were just, I don't know if they were just old or they made like a death pack together. I don't know, man, but like right when I needed them, they died. I'm not displeased though. The sewing machine I got is pretty dope. Anywho, with the collar turned inside out, I go ahead and bring it back to the iron to really lock down those creases and make it look much more finished. Then I went ahead and pinned the corners of this thing right where they would go onto the cloak. This is to make sure they're lining up exactly where I need them to be. With those in place, I turn the entire thing inside out. Again, we want to hide our seam as much as possible. With that there, I pin the rest of the neckline in place, locking in the collar in between the two other pieces of fabric. Then again, I run this sucker through the sewing machine, going through everything to lock it in. Now you can see once I turn it right side out, that seam looks super clean. It's hidden and look at how good this collar looks. 
I am super stoked about that. That's the first collar I've ever done without following a template. I've only done one other collar before. It was this pirate shirt that I made here on the show. But I am super happy with how this thing came out. Really cool. Okay, last thing I wanted to do is again, what we covered before is put some buttons into it. The coolest thing about that musketeer one when I was looking at it was all these buttons that ran down the front and the sides. Because of the implications from that, you can wear it as a cloak. You can wear it as like a jacket. You can change what's buttoned where and wear it differently. It's so cool. To place the buttons, I just measured exactly how far down I wanted them to go. I wanted them to end at my belt line. So I dropped a pin right there to mark it, making sure the pin only goes through that top layer of fabric. To figure out the sides where I want them to close so I can make a little sleeve out of it, I just kind of wore it and pinched it where I thought it felt comfortable. Then again, dropped a pin there. Then just made sure both sides were mirroring each other perfectly. Again, it's very stretchy fabric and I'm afraid that if I just have the buttonholes there, they're gonna kind of pull open over time or like the button itself is gonna kind of start to sag and not sit very nicely. So I wanted to add interfacing to those areas as well. By adding my pin as a marker, I can turn this thing inside out and see where in that area I want to add that interfacing. I only have the white interfacing left, but because I'm adding it to the thicker of the fabrics, I don't think it's going to show through. Now these silver buttons are what I'm using. So I use it as a measurement to make sure that I had enough interfacing to accommodate the hole in the button and all of that. But I simply cut it out of this rolled up piece of paper so that when I unroll it, I have a length that I need. Then iron them into place, fusing them to the fabric where I needed them to be. Once I turn it right side out, you can see that the fabric in these areas have a lot more body and can hold a lot more kind of weight in use. Next, I just mark where I want those buttonholes to land within that space, dropping one in at every four inches, making myself a little T mark here where I want them to begin. Now, the coolest thing about this machine, if you get a sewing machine, make sure you get it with a button foot. It has a button setting. This little plastic guy right here, it has a spot in it that extends out so you can actually sit your button into it and lock it into place. That makes it so that your machine knows exactly how big of a button you're making the hole for. Then you just kind of pull down this little lever here that'll interface with it. There are some other settings on it too to make buttonholes. I'm not going to go over it right now. You can read your specific instructions. Just kind of a buttonhole mark on the dial settings. Anyways, from here, all you do is line up those little T marks you made with the arrows that are on that foot and the line that is going to be your buttonhole along the arrow that goes towards the back. Then you just make this thing go and it'll go all the way to the end, hit the lever, which then tells it to turn around the opposite direction and completely autonomously make its own buttonhole. Look at how clean that comes out. That's so cool. From there, you just kind of pass a needle right on the end of it so that you don't go too far with your cut, throw a seam ripper in there and glide along the open space between the stitches. And boom, perfect buttonhole. That is so much easier than sewing them. Sewing them, really cool skill. Glad I know how to do it. Being able to do it on the machine, it's like a layup, it's so good. Still, if you have the time, so I did find the hand sewing very relaxing. I just don't have time in my life. I, I dish these things out so quick. But like I could see just totally hanging out on the couch watching a show sewing up buttonholes. That, that doesn't sound bad, that's all right. It is a skill that I'm gonna have to master because that's the whole point of these archetypes. I'm gonna have to learn how to do that well. Still, in a pinch, having a machine who can do it, that's pretty sweet. And it fits my button perfectly. Ah, so cool. Again, I used right where these holes were just to mark where the buttons themselves need to land and made a mark with my pencil. These buttons are actually a little bit easier than the last ones we did because they already have a shank. You were making a shank by twisting the thread around it. This one has this little loop in the back. So all we're doing with this is going through the back of the fabric through that little loop and then back into the fabric. And then we just go back and forth this way, passing it through the fabric, through our loop, and then back into the fabric. And then at the end, just like before, we tie off our knot and cut away the excess. Doing this, it was super easy to add all of my buttons where they go. And look at how cool this damn thing is. This is by far the most versatile, like, thing I've ever made. Not only can you wear it like I'm wearing it right now, like a little, a little jacket, well, really a long jacket, but you can do all the things you could do with a Rwanda cloak. So you can unbutton the sides, you can twist it around yourself. 
you know, kind of have one going over the side, which honestly also looks badass because now you can see the inside of that fabric. A little extra, a little pop of something. You can wear it as a little, the little hood here, which is super cool. But what's extra cool about it is because it has those buttons on the side, you have way more options to show stuff off. You can fold the front and button it into the side so that you show off your lapels and look more fancy. You can crisscross them and button them into place there. And now you look like a ninja assassin. You can just lock in a button in the center and now you have kind of a jaunty side cloak. Perfect for when you need to pull out iron and fight for your honor. There are so many ways you can wear this thing. Oh my God, I love it so much. I just sit there like buttoning things in different places trying to figure out what looks cool. Ah, it's so dope. That's something I completely forgot to mention though. To be able to do that, you actually have to be kind of strategic with your buttons. So the front of it, I did it how you'd normally button it, whatever side works for you. On the sides though, I altered which panel had buttons and which panel had holes. So like this front panel on the side has buttons and this panel on the side has holes to it. This makes it so that you can actually crisscross it. So I can bring these buttons around to this side and plug into these holes in the back. And then I can do the same thing on the opposite side. Giving me this really cool kind of cross look here with the button showing. Oh, it's so cool. I'm sorry, I can just keep gushing about this thing. The best part though, is it wasn't all that difficult. It wasn't too much different than my really quick slapdash orc costume, right? And by tackling this one first, I had the confidence to be able to just kind of, kind of whip this thing together. Most of the troubles I had were like, dealing with the type of fabric that I chose. And also camera angles. You have no idea how hard it is to film close-ups of you sewing. Man, the camera does not like to, to focus on anything but your fingers. But I learned so much by tackling these two projects. It was really, really cool to do. I highly recommend you give something like this a go. Just pick something, go to town with it and have fun. Especially if you're going to something like a LARP event or whatever, cause then you could just pull off any wacky thing that you got going on as long as it matches your theme and really have some fun with it. Though if you're running super last minute and can't see yourself making any clothing, might I recommend our friends over at Bergschneider. They've recently launched a brand new site, which I'll link to below, but our community gets 15% off of all of their wares by using the code SKILLTREE15 at checkout. And I'm pushing that for a couple of reasons. One, if you're gonna be buying stuff anyways, it does us a favor because we're an affiliate. But two, I honestly really like their stuff and it works as a great base. Like they've specifically designed their stuff as like a canvas for you to work on. Also while plugging stuff, I wanna remind y'all that we are going to be at Reckoning in like an NPC capacity. This is our third time going to this LARP and it's under new management and having worked with them and seeing kind of like what they've been putting together, I'm actually really excited to go. Also by being NPCs, we can set some stuff up so we can play with a lot of you, which is really what we wanna do. And if you need it, we're selling these bags that are like a LARP starter kit. It basically has stuff from like a fine leather bound notebook that we're making ourselves to toiletries and self-care stuff, some starter coins, some like extra puzzle things to get you hooked into a quest. We're really excited with how they're coming together. So yeah, if you're interested, again, link in the description below. And for one last thing, I just wanted to give love to our incredible community over on the Discord. They are posting stuff every day that is just amazing. Not only that, but the conversation there is incredible. A bunch of makers and just cool people who are getting together, sharing the stuff that they love. Definitely join the conversation. Link in the description below. All right, well, I hope you liked what we did here today. If you did, why don't you please give me some of that like and love and don't forget to subscribe so you know when I release new content. In the meantime, though, keep leveling up, you. You've made it to the end screen. YouTube loves it when you do that. It's a fantastic way to support this channel. Another fantastic way to support this channel is by joining these people's noble ranks. These are our Patreon members and we could not do any of this without them. On occasions where multi sewing machines break down and I need to buy one, they make that possible. Special shout out to our newest high tier level Patreon members, Max Pickholds, Heather Landers, Joe Smith, Kareen Bierman, Elise Q and Wendy Tyner. Thank you again, it means the world to us that you'll support us in this way and help make this tree bigger. If you like what we do here and want to support us, consider joining our Patreon, link in the description below. Or you can click on one of the videos showing on your screen now that YouTube thinks you'd like, and that honestly helps a lot too. And you know, leave comments and share the video, all that YouTube stuff is helpful. We really appreciate it.